So I wrote this sermon for the nursing home because uh, a few weeks ago, and it was just something that was going through my mind, something that really frustrates me about today's culture. You know, it's a lack of personal responsibility and people are doing what they're supposed to do. You know, rather we compare ourselves to what others are doing. I like to call it whataboutism. And I see it all the time with my students, you know. Hey, why did you get a C on this class? Why did you get a C? Well, I may have got a C, but, but what about the rest of the class? What about Dylan over there? Or what about Katie? I did better than them, right? Or, you know, we might see it most definitely from our politicians. You can't get a straight answer from any kind of politician. You ask them a question about why they support this policy or why did you make that choice? Well, I might have done that, but, but what about what the other side did, right? They're a lot worse than that. And, you know, I've got me to thinking that we have a tendency to do that in our lives as well as Christian. And it's not something new. It's human nature. And I was reading, you know, a few weeks ago, and I came across a whataboutism in the Bible. I got it from Peter. So if you want to turn to John chapter 21, that's where we're going to, to our text is going to come from tonight. But before we read there, let's kind of set the stage. And while you're turning there, I'll let you know what's going on. So Jesus had just risen from the dead, and he appeared before Peter alone and the disciples as a group, and as we learned, he let them know he was resurrected, and they were supposed to be getting ready to go out and glorify God. You know, in John 20, 21 reads, Jesus told them, and Jesus said to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. So they knew that they were supposed to be getting ready to go out into the world just as Jesus had come into the world. They were supposed to be getting ready to go out. So after this, the disciples left Jerusalem and went ahead to Galilee, as they were instructed to by Jesus, and was waiting for him to appear. But instead of beginning to tell people about the good news of a risen Christ, Peter kind of fell back into an old habit, because in John 21, 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing, you know, and, and he took six other disciples with them. And they just got me to thinking, you know, it, it, can you relate? Well, we're supposed to be out doing something for God sometimes. We just seem to kind of fall back into our old habits and, and do what we used to do and called other people and, and took other people with him and drugged them down instead of letting them do what they were supposed to do. But, you know, that's a whole other sermon for another time right there. But those men, they went out, they were out fishing, and they caught nothing in their boats. And then Jesus appeared to them on the shore. He told them to let their nets down again, and immediately they were full, and they recognized that man on the shore as Jesus. Does, does that sound familiar to anyone? Isn't it amazing that we have a God that doesn't change? You know, I think that's how, that's how Peter met Jesus the first time, right? He was out of fishing, didn't have anything in his nets. And, you know, it just kind of blew my mind. It's, it's an amazing God that never has changes. And he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But, again, that's a, that's a sermon for another time, right? So then the disciples came ashore. They sat down with Jesus. And then we get to the... The famous story about Peter's restoration there, where Jesus asked him three times if he loves him. And each time he's, you know, he's like, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And Peter's adamant that he does love him. So that's where we're kind of at right now. And then right after that happens, let's look at John chapter 21, verse 18. Right after that, Jesus says to, to Peter, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken to this, he said unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, following which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed? Which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and Lord, what shall that man do? And Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying around the brethren, abroad the, among the brethren, that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for the story about Jesus and Peter here. I pray that you fill me with your spirit, guide my words so I may say so, only what you need me to say, and open the hearts of those listening so they may be edified by the message. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, I find this passage very, very interesting to me because, you know, Jesus had just restored Peter. He just kind of pumped him up, and he's like, all right, you know, 
you denied me three times. Three times I'm asking if you love me. You know you do. Feed my sheep. And Peter's like, all right, I'm ready to go out and be. And then what does Jesus turn around and do there? He says, okay, well, let me tell you now, you're just going to die a horrible death. And you think Peter's, Peter's confidence just kind of had a woo, kind of little sink, sink down at that part. Why would Jesus do that to him? Well, for one, I think he did it to remind him that even though he was going to be kind of the leader of this group and he was wanting him to take charge, that it wasn't going to be easy. There was still going to be suffering involved with what he was have to do. But other than that, I think he also knew, right, how Peter would react. He knew that Peter was going to say, well, what about him? What are you going to do with him, right? And, and, and that's how we are, are often in our, in our life, right? Peter had to be thinking, you know, surely if I'm going to be the one out feeding the sheep and it's going to happen to me, surely he's going to die a horrible death too, right? Surely everybody here is going to, that's going to happen, right? It's going to happen to everybody, Jesus. And that's probably what he wanted to hear. He wanted to... He wanted to compare what was going on in the other's life to that, of, to that of his. It's a sin dating back as old as time, dating back to the Garden of Eden, you know, where we want to compare and we want to be like other people. When the serpent tempted Eve, telling her if she ate the fruit, she would be as God. And Eve then, you know, compared herself to God. I want to be like that. Well, Peter's like, well, if I'm going to die, I think everybody else should have to die like that too, right? That's probably what he's thinking in his mind. In these two examples, though, we can kind of see why people compare themselves with others. First, jealousy and envy, right? We are envious of what other people have, and we're jealous of other people just in general. Another way to say that is we are covetous human beings. We always want what we cannot have. Another reason we might compare is that we are trying to make ourselves feel better about our own shortcomings or our lot in life, what has been assigned to us. Or in other words, we're kind of being prideful now. No matter what our reasoning is, it's a sin. And it's something we should not do. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 reads, For we dare not make ourselves in the number, or compare ourselves with some that condemn themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Right? If we are not wise, then what are we? We're fools. And we ought not be fools. I've identified like three areas in our Christian life where we tend to compare ourselves with others. And I know there's places in my life where I've done this. When I look at this and I want to compare, and I'm sure you have too, and I want to say, well, what about this person? Or what about that person? What about them? What are they doing? What makes them so special? When I should not be asking that. Instead, I should be asking what the title of my message is tonight. What about me? What am I doing here at this point in my life? Where am I doing to make my life better, to make it more of a life worthy of pleasing God? Where am I accepting personal responsibility and focusing on my own behavior? So the first kind of area I notice where we want to look towards other people and maybe not focus so much on ourselves is in our service to the Lord, right? We all have a calling, and we're all given our own special gifts. You know, we have all at least have one spiritual gift we've been given when we, when we came to salvation, right? These are gifts are given to us by God, at the moment of salvation. And not everyone's going to receive the same gift. In Romans chapter 12, verse, starting on verse 3, the Bible reads, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are in one body in Christ, and every member is one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So you see here, Paul's directing the Romans that we ought not think more highly of ourselves, right? We don't need to compare ourselves, say, I'm better than you because I have this gift, or I'm not quite as good as you because you have a gift that's better than me. So we don't need to think of ourselves better or less. Why? Because we're all in that body of Christ, right? It takes everything to make up the body of Christ, and we're all made differently. Each one of us is uniquely made by God. He, each, our creator made us to fit together perfectly so we can work in harmony to build up the church, to edify the church, to use our spiritual gifts. All right, go ahead and turn over to Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And while you're turning there, but, you know, since we are unique, we shouldn't compare ourselves to each other. There are many spiritual gifts that we're given, right? And not one of us in this room have all of those. But there's not one of us in this room that does not have one either. Don't think that you do not have a gift. God, if you are a believer today, God has gifted you 
with something. You know, gifts and found found in the scripture include maybe you might have the gift of wisdom in teaching, where it means you have the ability to, to study, understand, and instruct others of the word of God. Maybe you have the gift of mercy, right, where you have empathy and the ability to feel sorry for each other and reach out to someone and help in their suffering. Maybe you have the gift of giving and you have the desire and the ability to give up your money or time to glorify God. Maybe you have the gift of encouragement, the gift of administration, the gift of leadership, right? Maybe you have the gift of hope, the gift of love. There's lots of them, and everybody has one of those gifts. And not everybody is going to have all of them, but nobody's left without one, and they are all of needing. So what you should be asking yourself is, what about me? What kind of gifts do I have? What have I been blessed with? Not what, about, or not what about Josh. What's Josh's gift? You know, how is his gift better than mine? Man, I wish I could sing. I wish I had that gift. I wish I had Sean's gift where I could play the guitar. Something like that. We should not be looking at that. And it all fits together. And I had you guys turn to 1 Corinthians, and I actually forgot to turn there myself. I was supposed to be flipping there at the same time you were. But all this, all these gifts, they're all meant to work together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible reads, starting off in verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. We are all needed, right? As I said, God perfectly made us, uniquely made us, and he made us all to fit together, right? He gave us all a gift. So when we come together as a church, we can all take our gifts and we can put them together. So we should not be comparing ourselves and wishing that we had the gifts of the other people. Instead about, what about my gift? What can I do to fit into the group as a whole? Where do I fit in this body? Where can I come to edify the church, right? So that's kind of how we get our gifts and how, how we should think about them. What is the purpose of this gifts? Well, I just said it. We want to edify the church and bring glory to God. That's the whole purpose of why we're doing this, right? Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. Our gifts are supposed to be used for the betterment of the church. To lift up our brothers and sisters, not to gain the praise of others or to bring glory to ourselves. You know, we don't look at our gifts to say, look at how great of a Christian I am. You know, I'm so much better than you all because I get to come up here and preach and you guys just got to sit there and listen. No, that's not why I do it. I do it because I believe that I got a gift to do it and it's God's calling and I want to do it to edify the church, to bring, ultimately bring glory to God. And we shouldn't look at other people who are using their gifts and think like, like that also. You know, we shouldn't put people on a pedestal and think more highly of them because of the gifts that they have. You know, think, why can't I preach a sermon? Why can't I get up here and sing a special, you know? How come whenever I can't go out and, and soul win as good as somebody else? When I, when I seem to witness the people, I just don't get as many people turning to Christ as other people do. No, we're just called to do the work, to use our gifts, Use the gifts God gave you and don't do it to be seen by men. Do it to lift up men and glorify God. As it says in the book of Colossians, chapter uh, 3, verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So that's the first way where we compare ourselves, I think, too often. right? We compare ourselves in our serving, in our calling, and what we're supposed to be doing instead of looking at ourselves. So don't look at others there. Think about what about me. But the next way we like to compare ourselves with the others is through the, our success, right? What do we view as being a success? What does the world tell you is successful? It's by your possessions, right? What do you have? What kind of car do you drive? How big is your house? How big is your bank account? What type of foods do you eat? Do you wear designer brand clothing, right? 
The world, uh, the world makes you want to care about your image and how you appear, that outward appearance. And if you carry that on well, they'll think you're successful and you'll fit right in with them. But if you don't fit in with them, they like to shame you and cast you down. So let me illustrate this with a story that I saw the other day, right? And you can tell me at the end who do you think was more successful. So there's a man and a woman, and they take their kids, and they're sitting on the van, and they take their iPad, and they got it hanging from the mirror. And they went, and they got a bunch of candy from the dollar store, and they're just sitting in the van at their house, sitting there in their parking lot, watching a movie together as a family. The next door neighbors come out, man and a wife. You know, the guy's all dressed up in his fancy suit. The wife's got his mink fur coat on. And they see those people sitting in the van over there, and they just start laughing at him. The guy in the, in the nice suit goes over and taps on the window and gets that man out of his car and says, what are you doing in here? And the guy explains to him, he's like, well, you know, we decided that we need to spend more time as a family. So my wife, she quit work so she could stay home with the kids during the day. And I cut back on my hours, so money's a little bit tight for us. And one of the things we always like to do is we like to go to the drive-in, but we really can't afford that now. So we decided we're just going to sit here in our van as a family, and, and we're going to watch a movie on this iPad and get the drive-in experience here at home. And that guy just starts laughing at him. He says, I can't believe you do that. Don't you want your kids to be better off than you were? Don't you want them to have more things than you had when you were a kid? He's like, that's why me and my wife, that's why we work so hard. That's why we're always traveling around making business deals. You know, my son just turned 16 last week, and I brought him this brand new nice car. And the other guy's like, oh, yeah, I noticed that. He had a party at his house. He had all his friends there, right? He's like, yeah. So they talked there a little bit longer, and that guy's like, you know, you might want to rethink the, the guy in the suit, the fancy guy, I call him. He tells the other guy, he's like, you might want to rethink this, right? You might want to think, because your kids are going to hate you someday. They're going, to, they're going to look down on you and say, Dad, why didn't we have all those nice things that those other families had? Why didn't we get to take those trips? Why didn't I have the nice electronics? Why didn't I get a car on my 16th birthday? And then he goes on his way. Fancy guy does, goes back over to his wife. And, and the guy, the daddy gets back in his van, and he's just got this sad look on his face, and his wife kind of asks him what's wrong. He doesn't want to talk about it. And then finally he tells her what they talked about out there, and she reassures him that they are, they're doing the right thing, and they go back to watching the movie. And about that time, over in the other house, the, the kid pulls up in his car, and he's got his little 14-year-old sister with him. And the mom and dad, they're all dressed up all nights with him. They go over there. And they try to give that boy a hug as he gets out of his car and say, hey, let's go out. We got a birthday party planned for you next week. And they can hear through the windows that boy just mouthed out to his parents, last week was my birthday and you didn't even care to be here. You don't care about me now. Why do you think I should just drop everything? I got plans with my friends tonight, right? You weren't here on my birthday. My birthday was last week and you didn't even bother to show up. In fact, then the sister chimes in and says, yeah, I had a gymnastics meet last week. I won first place and there was no one there to celebrate with me. They're like, oh, yeah, but we, we sent you presents. We sent you gifts. They said, well, just because you do that and then you show up, you think we should just drop everything to spend our time with you? And they storm off and want nothing to do with the mom and the dad. So you tell me who's being more successful there? Is it the rich family? Or is it the one that gave up some material possessions in order to spend time with their kids? I think if we all think about it really hard, we'll realize that possessions don't always make us happy. Possessions are not what we need. Possession, possessions do not define success. They do not equate to happiness. You know, in fact, in, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus kind of said that. We were talking about clothes and food. Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So when we're looking at ourselves and we're saying, what about me? My success, right? We're not going to say, well, what about them? What do they have? We're going to say, what about me? We need to look and see what Jesus wants for us to be considered successful. You know, what does Jesus say? He says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God. He tells you to not put treasures on earth where moth does rest and destroy, but rather seek up treasures in heaven, right? So he wants us to possess things. He does. So we should have stuff that we possess but it's not the physical type of things that he wants, right? What type of things does Jesus want? Well, first he wants us to have wisdom, right? We should definitely try to possess wisdom. Proverbs 3, 13 through 14 says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof is fine gold. Wisdom. You know where we get wisdom? We get wisdom in this book. We get wisdom by knowing the word of God. 
But it's more than just knowledge that we get out of this book, right? We just don't read it. We put it into practice, right? And it's the most valuable thing we could have. You know, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. When we're following this book, we're displaying our love of God. And that is the greatest commandment, right? To love the Lord our God with all our heart. So when we have wisdom, that's what we're doing. We're displaying the love of God. Follow the example of Solomon, right? He could have anything that he wanted. God said, I'll give you whatever you want. What do you want? And he asked for wisdom. And God gave it to him. And then God went above and beyond and gave him riches beyond compare. So if you lack wisdom, get into the word. Study your Bible more often. Try to put it into practice. When you hear messages, go out and do what you heard. And if you're having trouble with that, you know what? Ask for it. In James 1.5, the Bible tells us, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God to give it all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God wants you to have wisdom. That is the, the first thing he wants you to possess to be successful. Beyond wisdom, though, we also need to possess character. What is character? Character means that our actions, our behaviors, our words towards others, they're moral and good. All the time, not just when people are watching, not just to impress our friends, not just to get us a better position in line or get us a better job at work. We need to treat people with the dignity and the respect they deserve. Not to take advantage of anyone because we're all created in the image of God, right? Romans 13 explains this to us in, in uh, verses 7 and 8. It says, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but to love one another. For the he that hath loved one another hath fulfilled the law. Right? So we should have godly wisdom, as I first said, right? That's loving God. Here we have character. There we're loving our brothers. There we have just fulfilled the two major points of the law. And I say we're almost being pretty successful right now for fulfilling those two points. Right? But the last thing I think God wants from us in order to say that we're really successful in this life is to be good stewards of what God has given us. You know, Luke 12, 48 says, for unto, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. You know, as we talked about earlier, we all have our different gifts. We all have our different services, our different skills, our different talent levels. And we've got to be good stewards of those. We've got to use our talents for good and to, and to edify that church and to glorify God. Others, they might be blessed with more wealth more personal possessions, but whether it be material, wealth, talents, or gifts, what do we do with them? We use them to bring people to Christ. We use it to give God the glory, to come to the saving power of Christ. We use it to give what he gave us for his glory to grow his kingdom. And that is what makes us successful. It's not how other men look at us. It's not when we're going to say, well, what about them? They seem to have more than me. No, that's not what we want. I know what I would believe would make my life successful, as if one day I get to heaven and Jesus looks at me and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. It doesn't matter what anybody around me has or what anybody else has done. What matters to me is if I have done right in Jesus' eyes at the end. So here we've seen so far that we should not compare ourselves to others when it comes to our service to the Lord. We should definitely not compare ourselves to what makes us successful. And finally, most important in my opinion, we should not compare ourselves with each other when it comes to sin. Not at all. Turn, if you were, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, right? And a lot of times when we compare ourselves to other, other people when it comes to sin, we're doing it out of pride. You know, it's a pride issue. We're trying to make ourselves feel better about what we have done. And I believe that this sin, this sin of compare, comparing our sin to other people's, you know, has sent more people to hell than any other sin that there's ever been. Let's look at an illustration here in Luke, right? Luke chapter 18, almost there. Luke chapter 18, starting off in verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that stumbled himself shall be exalted. So here the publican, he humbled himself. He admitted his sin. He was the justified one. Not the, not the Pharisee. Not the one that was, that was comparing himself to other people. This is how it is when other people try to compare their sin with others. And that's why I said it sent more people to hell than any other sin I can think of. Because when we compare our sin, what we're basically saying is, hey, I'm not that bad. Uh, I could be a lot worse. I'm not that bad. And when you're saying something like that, you don't believe in your heart that you need a Savior. Because you're not as bad as other people. You know, sure, there's a hierarchy of sins. You know, Pastor posted something about this on his Facebook the other day. You know, there are some sins that are more grievous than others. You can see that in, in the law of Moses because of the different penalty structures that were been there. And even when Jesus was talking to Pilate, he said, those that have turned you over have, considered, have committed the greater sin. And we'll see that difference in our punishment, on our earthly punishment, right? But our punishment from sin, from God's standpoint, may be different earthly standards, but from a heavenly standpoint, there's a price to pay. And it's the same for all, no matter what kind of sin you have. But people say, I haven't committed murder. I haven't molested a child. I haven't raped anyone. You know, I haven't even physically beat anyone down. I'm a pretty good person. I'm not as bad as the world out there. There's no way that God's going to send me to hell. I want to look at him and say, really? Are you sure about that? Have you ever read Revelation chapter 21, verse 8? That's right where I want to take him. I want to show him. Because there it says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the adulterers. And by this point, they're probably thinking, see, I told you, I'm none of those people. But what's the very next line in this? It says, and all liars, right, shall have their place in the lake which burneth with the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see that? All liars. I'm sure that there's someone in here, there's people in here who never told a lie, right? Never in their life. Never even as a kid, never as an adult, wow. right? Was there anybody like that? Anybody, anybody willing, brave enough to stand up and say, you know what? I've never told a lie in my life. Wow. No, that, that is all of us, right? right? But there'll be people that will claim that they haven't sinned because they haven't done any of those horrible things. They haven't done this. And you say to them, hey, but all liars. And if they say they haven't sinned, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in them. Right? That's what First John tells us, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when it comes to sin, there should be no comparison with one another. No what about what he did. No what about what she did. No, no, it's what about what did I do? What have I done? And the truth is, I have sinned. And I don't need to compare with anybody else because you break one area of the law, you've broken the whole law when it comes to God's eyes. So there's no need for comparison. And because of that, you know what? Romans 6.23 says that wages is a sin. What, I, what I've earned is death from that one little sin. So we don't compare our sin. What do we do with our sin? We confess our sin, right? We tell God about it because 1 John also tells us right after, right after he tells us if uh, we, we say we don't sin, we've deceived ourselves, the very next verse he says, you know, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and it cleanses from all unrighteousness. And when we confess our sins and we call on Jesus Christ to save us, and we trust in his finished work on the cross, not that we're better than someone else, then we get that gift. It's talked about in Romans 6.23, because right after he tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we need to look at our own sin and not say, what about others? I'm not as bad as them. What about me? What have I done? And look inward and confess that sin, trust in Christ, and get that free gift. So in conclusion, let's remember that we have no need to compare ourselves with each other. Specifically when it comes to our service for the Lord, our success, and most definitely our sins. You know, recall a verse we read near the beginning of this message. Remember 2 Corinthians 10, 12. I feel it's worth repeating. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Let us be wise and not compare ourselves to others. Of course, that's easy to say, but how we do that? Yes. I like to say we do it with an attitude of gratitude, right? 
One of my favorite songs that we sing here is when we sing Count Your Blessings. Count Your Blessings, count them one by one. I love that song. And I especially like it when sometimes when Aaron up here singing, he'll just stop. And he'll say, does anybody got any blessings to share? And I love that part. And I'm sitting up there thinking, man, I got so many of them going through my head. And, and they're not big things, you know. I'm just thinking of everything that I have. So shortly after I presented this, a much shorter version of this to the nursing home residents, you know, I kind of made a conscious effort to, to count my blessings every day. So I get up in the morning and I just be like, God, thank you. I had a bed to sleep in. You know, maybe I wouldn't do this every day, but I, I try. Thank you, God. I got food in the refrigerator today. You know, thank you, God. I got a vehicle to drive to work today. One day I was looking in the mirror and I was like, thank you, God, for giving me this wonderful, healthy body that I can be able to function in. Then I kind of looked down and I said, well, I don't know if I should really thank you for this or not. <laughs> but then a small little voice inside me, God told me, he said, I didn't do that. He said, you did that one on your own. I just made it stretchy so you wouldn't explode. I said, hey, that's a good point. But God, thank you for doing that. The point here is that there's nothing too big or too small that you shouldn't thank Jesus for. And the more you think, what about me? What has my God done for me? The less you're going to worry about what other people have, what other people are doing and you'll lose the comparisons, and you'll live a more joyful life that is better and more pleasing to God. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for your lessons on not comparing to each other. Lord, I just hope that everyone who heard this message tonight is going to look inward, look inside themselves, and think, what about me, Lord? How can, how can I become a better Christian? I don't need to compare myself to what others are doing. I need to take the gifts that you've given me and, and I need to use them to glorify you. I need to use them to edify the church. I don't need to worry about the gifts that other people have and what they're doing with them. I need to focus on myself in this matter. I want you, hope you, uh, you open some hearts and say, so people aren't looking at their neighbors or their friends and saying, you know, they have more than me, so they must be more successful because they have more possessions. Let them look inside and say, am I being successful for God? Am I doing what God wants me to do? And finally, I hope everyone, that when they look at their sin, they don't get a boisterous attitude thinking that, you know, they're better than someone else. That just because that they haven't done maybe a, a quote-unquote major sin, I hope they know that they're still a sinner and they still need a Savior. They still need to give themselves up to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I pray, Lord, that uh, for everyone that's still sick, hasn't made it here tonight, Lord, I pray that you be with them and, and you help them get better so we can have a, a fuller house here when it comes to our Wednesday night service. And I pray that anybody that heard this message that has not accepted Christ as their Savior, that maybe they do so tonight. I ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.